All right, Brittany, was that my cue? <laughs> yeah, you're good to go. <laughs> All right, um, sounds good. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Ben Wood, and um, I am um, the Senior Director of Policy and Practice at an organization called Health Resources in Action. Um, not going to spend too much time talking about what that is. Uh, but I, um, I've only been in that role for just a few months now, um, and most recently coming from a, a long stint at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, um, where I had um, the pleasure of um, developing a lot of the guidance and um, supporting hospitals through this um, program called the Determination Need Program, which um, is... Um, behind the resources that Bay State is using to um, implement this uh, grant program. So I'm really familiar with the concepts and the, the types of um, things that we ask hospitals to do in partnership with the um, community um, to make um, good um, and impactful investments with um, um, community health resources that hospitals are spending. So. Um, Brittany and Anna Marie and Lisa asked if I would um, kick off this uh, workshop series uh, with a conversation about uh, really sort of really what upstream public health um, really means. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, this is gonna be fairly basic, I think, maybe for a lot of people, um, but um, hopefully um, still useful and um, I think good practice just to uh, use the same sort of language um, and um, uh, an understanding of, of these terms like upstream public health or the social determinants of health and that sort of thing so that we're all operating from a, a similar place of um, understanding as we um, implement um, interventions or we respond to opportunities like these um, like these RFPs um, that Bay State has that are that are out and so I'm going to talk maybe for about 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes or so, and then um, we're going to be breaking into smaller groups, um, although I'm not really sure based upon how many folks are here what that, what that will look like, but that will be in Brittany and uh, Brittany's hands to uh, figure out. So um, with that, um, kick this off. Um, just wanted to start with um, my definition of what the social determinants of health um, is um, and means. Um, you know, a lot of people, um, I think, overcomplicate uh, this, this concept. Um, so um, this is just the way that I like to, um, to think about it. So the social determinants of health, they're the things, really, sort of the, the environments or the conditions or the circumstances that, that uh, we regularly encounter and navigate and deal with that make it easier or harder to lead a, um, to lead a healthy life. Um, so um, a couple of important um, concepts related to the social terms of health, they, they heavily influence our behavior, um, which leads to positive or negative health outcomes, right? So um, you live in a community where um, there is no grocery store, you're reliant on public transportation. So it's, um, it's harder to um, get to a place where you have a wide selection of fresh fruits and vegetables, for example. Um, so um, the, the social determinants of health are really influencing the ways in which we shop and um, things that we we're bringing home to cook and eat. Um, they also impact us very directly um, without um, having behavior as a, um, as a mediator. Um, so classic example that I like to use is um, family who lives in a home where there's chronic um, mold um, conditions that exacerbate a child's asthma. There is no behavior that is um, that um, that kid is engaging in that um, um, leads to the exacerbation of asthma. It's because they live in a home where there's chronic mold, and there's the, the trigger is um, is um, is constantly exacerbating exacerbating that kid's asthma. So the social determinants of health, a little bit about how they're created, um, didn't come out of uh, thin air. <laughs> Um, so that the things that we regularly encounter, navigate, and deal with, um, that make it easier or harder to lead a healthy life, they're, they're not there by accident or happenstance. They're the result of um, intentional policy 
um, decisions and, and institutional practices um, that create advantage um, for white people and, and disadvantage for black, indigenous, and, um, and uh, person of color communities. Um, they also really serve to maintain class differences um, and um, serve to maintain advantages based upon a whole range of um, identities. Um, so advantages for people without disabilities, for example. Uh, take home message uh, related to the social determinants of health that we like to try and um, try and drive home is that um, the social determinants of health create advantage and disadvantage. They create opportunity and they create exposures. Uh, and that those advantages and disadvantages are created by people, right? Um, so they're created um, by folks and they're perpetuated through government practices and policies, uh, and institutional policies and practices, um, which is really the good news <laughs> at the end of the day, because if they're created by folks, um, they can be dismantled uh, and they can be changed. Uh, and we can work to, um, to um, create um, different ways of, of being and different, um, uh, enacting different policies and making different decisions um, so that um, there, is, uh, um, there is not this uh, incredibly unlevel um, playing field to, to, lead a, um, to lead a healthy life. This so the final thing I'll say just um, is that there's um, you know, this, this notion that when people say this social students felt they're it's usually, it's usually sort of in a, um, there's a negative connotation, right? Um, that they are things that are causing harm, but um, uh, it's equally important for us to be thinking about the social determinants of health as, um, as things that create advantage um, and create opportunity for people. Um, all right, so to illustrate these points, um, people often use this, a, a tree. <laughs> Um, to depict the difference between um, social determinants of health um, and behaviors uh, in the chain of factors that lead to health. Um, so in this, um, in, this, uh, um, in, in this graphic here, we have um, the, the leaves of the tree are, are outcomes and the, the branches are the behaviors and the trunk um, are the social determinants of health. And uh, in this in this graphic that we have these six domains that are the, the that are the domains that the Department of Public Health um, has put forward to provide guidance um, on um, on these concepts for for hospitals and health systems um, and um, underneath those underneath the the trunk um, you have um, what are what are called the the root causes of course so the um, the the the, the practices and the beliefs um, that create advantage and disadvantages based on race and gender and class. Um, beliefs and practices that are rooted in white supremacy culture. Those are the, those are the, um, those are the, 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 the causes, the root causes that um, create um, either advantage or disadvantage in the, uh, in the social determinants of health. Um, so the, the more um, uh, downstream um, we're working, um, the more sort of we're working at the, the health behavior um, level and the more upstream we're working, we're, we're trying to actually um, uh, address um, the, um, the, the, those conditions in the, in the trunk um, and um, work to address the, um, the ways in which um, those, um, those issues are, um, are, are playing out and um, actually addressing sort of the, um, those root causes. So um, I think that the, the, there's lots of different ways for people to sort of think about how to situate themselves in doing upstream or downstream um, work. Collectively, I think it's really, you know, it's fair to say that um, we're all trying to see positive change in our communities up in the leaves of the tree, right? So well-intentioned work, no matter um, how far upstream um, we're, we're working, if they're not ultimately creating better health outcomes for folks, it's it's you know why are we doing that work? What are, what are we actually going for? But the point is to try to um, focus more upstream so that we're creating the conditions for more sustainable change. We're creating more choice and opportunity um, for folks, um, um, leading to um, healthier lives. Working to address the unfair and unjust um, conditions that exist in uh, in communities. So. Um, it, it's, it's sort of incumbent upon us to try to understand um, sort of where it is that we're situating the, the good ideas and solutions that we have 
um, to address health outcomes. Uh, and I found uh, um, one of the simplest ways to make that distinction um, is um, between upstream and downstream is to try and answer this question of where the burden of change is falling. Um, so basically, are we asking people, individuals, right, um, to modify their behaviors to fit whatever situation they're in that is causing an issue that's leading to um, um, poor um, health outcomes? If so, if, if the answer to that is yes, that likely to be, it's likely to be a more downstream intervention, right? <laughs> Excuse me. So that uh, example um, of the of the kid with um, uncontrolled asthma, um, if our approach to dealing with that is to develop, um, you know, just for example, to develop a protocol for um, for the, for the kid's family to um, ensure better medication adherence. Um, this is an intervention that may have incredibly positive um, and immediate impacts. You might keep the um, kid um, out of the emergency room, might increase their quality of life, um, but it's not doing anything to mitigate um, or eliminate the asthma triggers, right? It's creating, it's creating a, a process for that kid to adapt to that, that living situation uh, in ways that are beneficial, but it's not about actually addressing it. So if the burden of change shifted, so we were concerning ourselves with the uh, chronic mold conditions in the kid's home, we'd be moving farther upstream. If we concerned our, ourselves with uh, understanding why that family is living in a place that is unsafe and unhealthy in the first place, we'd be moving even further upstream. Um, so really at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's trying to ask this question of, of who we're expecting to do the work to improve um, health outcomes. If we're asking that question routinely and if you can find answers, uh, find that your answers include something or someone um, other than the individual experiencing the pain, then you're probably moving uh, in that upstream direction. Um, I would just see, I would um, um, just close this 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 graphic out by saying that that both both the upstream and the downstream are incredibly important, um, and um, we need to be doing both, right? Um, but there are um, important distinctions to be made between um, the two. Um, and um, the problem is when we're only doing the downstream work, we're just sort of in this cycle of continually applying Band-Aids. Um, and uh, the question that we have to ask ourselves is how do we get out of that cycle? Um, and how are we moving towards more sustainable um, change opportunities? So I'm gonna give you um, one example um, of a tool that um, we like to use to go through a, a thought process of um, of trying to make those distinctions and trying to understand um, if we're doing the downstream approach, why we're doing the downstream approach and being super intentional about that and not just taking it for granted that that is what we should be doing. Um, and um, then to sort of diagnose and help us sort of think about moving, um, uh, moving upstream. So, um, here are the areas that have been chosen by the community advisory committees at each of the four hospitals. Um, two have decided to um, focus on education as a sort of social determinant health priority area. Two have decided to focus on the social environment as a priority, social determinant of health priority area. Uh, and each of the um, each of the hospitals and their committees have community, community advisory committees have. Um, sort of drilled into what those um, those actually mean, and, and um, are trying to get more specific about sort of the change that they're um, change that they're seeking. I'm going to use the um, education and career readiness example using this tool um, to um, walk through some of the some of these upstream and downstream concepts. All right, so um, this tool is. Um, in, in, other, um, in other spaces, we call it the, the racial justice reframing tool. Um, really, it's, it's basically, this is, a, this is an exercise in um, defining the problem um, and then sort of playing out how different solutions can be based on uh, the answer to um, answer the question of how you're defining what the problem is. Um, so what it does is it gives you these um, five questions that are about um, framing, um, framing the issue at hand. 
Uh, so you have a question about uh, what's the problem, what's the cause um, of that problem, and trying to be um, specific about who you think is responsible or what you think is responsible. Um, and then based upon the cause, what are the what is the solution, the actions that are needed, actions to sort of be in the steps um, that can be taken to, um, to, um, to implement the solution that you think is the appropriate one to be implementing. And then super importantly, sort of what are some of the values that are underpinning the approach um, that, um, that you're taking based upon the way in which you've um, defined the problem. So um, taking this example of um, sort of, a, of education to employment and career readiness, um, I don't really know what the conversations were that led to that, um, to that um, choice of, um, of, of priority. Um, but I could surmise that maybe it's that um, the problem that was being named is that maybe there are high poverty rates in a community. Um, so just sort of playing off that as an example, um, by naming the problem as high poverty, high, high poverty rates, potentially, um, the, the cause could be um, that there are um, folks who, um, who, who do not want to work, um, that there are um, people who are lacking financial education. Um, that people maybe have um, poor spending habits, um, maybe that there's simply just maybe a, a lack of jobs that exist in that community without sort of a uh, sort of an understanding or analysis of why that might be. Um, under that framing, um, you would you would probably say that individuals are the ones who are responsible. Using that framing, then maybe the solutions would be things like um, jobs training. Um, things like um, providing um, um, access to associate college degree programs, things like um, healthcare job pipelines, which is a, you know, a pretty common strategy that is uh, employed um, uh, in a lot of these types of, um, of settings. Um, so then the types of, uh, types of actions that might um, flow from those types of um, solutions could be educational um, campaigns or things that just basically raise awareness uh, in communities or, um, or programs that help um, people get their GED. Um, values that might be highlighted um, using that type of um, traditional approach could be some of these real sort of common American values that get um, espoused all the time. Things like striving, you know, like, you know, it, it's, it's, on, it's on you to um, sort of push yourself forward, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, really sort of uh, individualistic way of, um, of thinking about what the problem is and then what the solutions are. Uh, if you go into the right-hand side of our column and you start thinking about um, the, the um, reframing the, um, the issue, um, you start thinking maybe, all right, so maybe it's not that um, the framing of the issue is not just that there are high poverty rates, but maybe there are high poverty rates um, that are, are different by race. So maybe there's much higher poverty rates um, for black families in our region than there are um, for white families in our region. Um, and so simply by being more specific about the differences in, um, in population outcome, population level outcomes by race forces us to be more explicit about the causes of those differences. And then that's really what this is all about. So the, those differences by um, race tell us that there is an injustice present. Um, and so the solutions and actions we take should then be sort of reframed um, to, to tackle some aspect of that injustice. Um, so our, our problem might be reframed to be that in our region, um, there is occupational segregation, um, which, is, which is the case if you look at data. Um, white people in our region in Western Massachusetts, I forgot to say folks, um, I live in Northampton, I'm a Western Mass person um, uh, and I've um, been here for, um, been here for a, a long time. Um, so um, people in our region, um, uh, white folks in our region are overrepresented in jobs that have that pay well, have safe working conditions, um, have better um, benefits. Um, so the cause um, then should relate to why that is. So um, practices like redlining, they create more wealth for white families, um, but they also create wealth, more wealth um, and investments in communities that are more white um, because of higher property values, higher property values equals more resources for economic investment, more money for schools and all the sorts of things that, um, th that leads to sort of a perpetual cycle of, um, of better opportunities for higher paying jobs um, and, um, and better outcomes. 
and so framed this way, the the who of 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 sort of responsibility or the what of responsibility are institutions and government um, decisions that perpetuate those types of practices. Um, so then our solutions could also be at the policy and institutional level if we sort of are framing out some of the the um, the cause um, and the 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 who of what are responsible of who of is responsible at, at um, being at that policy um, and institutional level. Um, so sort of things like, um, you know, pay, act, pay equity practices within, the, um, within a, a particular job industry or, um, or mobilization around um, living wage ordinances or implementation of ban the box policies so that people with um, um, some form of criminal um, uh, history are not um, immediately shut out of, 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 of employment opportunities. Things that create different um, types of workplace safety practices. So um, if the problem is at the policy level, maybe the solutions should be at the policy um, and practice level as well. And then so things um, that you, know, you could be thinking about the types of actions that relate to those, everything from sort of real upstream um, um, strategies to um, start tackling these, these issues at the community level um, really early on in life. So maybe maybe a, um, a career readiness strategy is all about pre-K um, investment, right? So that we're, we're trying to create the conditions for lifelong learning um, much earlier on um, in, the, in the life cycle. Um, or it could be um, funding um, activities that are all about community mobilization and advocacy, right? So if, if what, of what the identified solution is, is a policy solution, a big P policy solution, you know, something that needs to change um, within um, sort of local government or state government, maybe you're actually, you're, you're actually funding the type of community mobilization that can move you to, um, move you to that point. And so the values that might be highlighted under this type of approach um, are reframed from um, individual level responsibility to more, um, to more sort of social, um, uh, social values around equity and justice and fairness. Um, just close out by saying these are sort of like super illustrative, like the, the, the differences here between these columns are um, sort of are, are, are designed to be um, as different as you can possibly make them out to be. It's not that you're bad in any sense of the word if you're sort of following a more traditional approach. Um, the framing here is negative, but that's really just to, to, to make a point. Um, obviously, the things that we're doing or, or things that people could be doing down a traditional path are important things to be doing to, again, address the immediate harms that are present in people's lives. <laughs> but, the, but the point is that if we're not doing, um, if we're not doing things um, differently, if we're not actually trying to identify some of those more upstream um, solutions and causes, then, um, you know, we're going to, again, be sort of caught in this perpetual cycle of, um, of applying band-aids um, and um, not ultimately um, shifting and changing the things that um, create more opportunity for people to lead a healthy life. Um, so those are just some examples of um, ways to, um, to be thinking about um, framing out and, and um, coming up with um, solutions to um, the, the, the issues that you think are important um, in the communities that you guys are, are, are working in, focusing on, um, and will better sort of meet the um, intent and the way in which Bay State has sort of put out these um, requests for proposals to, um, to, again, spur sort of thought and, um, and action at that more upstream, um, upstream level. So with that, I think I'm done. Uh, last slide, which is just about health research and action. I'm not going to talk about it. this. is the organization I work for. If people want to know what HRA is all about. I'm happy to talk about it a little bit more, but um, no need to really focus on that. Um, and that's my email. If people want to get in touch with me, I'm happy to, um, happy to do any follow-up. So Brittany, I don't know. Do you want to take yeah. it from here? Thanks so much, Ben. We really appreciate it. I know you have such a history here in Western Mass, so we really appreciate you speaking, not just from the state level, but from our local level too. Um, so we're gonna do a couple of things. First thing is just open up to any folks who have questions for Ben specifically. 
uh, related to his presentation. And then after that, we're going to actually stay in the bigger room because we have a, a more intimate group today. So um, in that portion, we'll have some of our yeah, hospital community benefit advisory council members share a little bit more, Ben, to your question during the presentation of like why they chose the focus areas they selected so folks can get an understanding of kind of what the groups were really looking to impact. Um, so first, does anyone have any questions for Ben? Feel free to virtually raise your hand or unmute um, if you want to ask something. And Ben, maybe do you want to just take down your slides and then we can see the people? There we go. That's great. Questions for Ben? Not it's because you did a phenomenal job. <laughs> <laughs> Do people feel confident um, in, in responding to a, um, a grant opportunity that is, um, is challenging you to come up with more upstream solutions? I'm not, I'm not getting affirmative <laughs> shakes or, or, or negative um, head shakes. So That's a great question. Um, I see a yes in the chat and I'll say from, I know some of our CBAC representatives, if you want to speak to from that perspective of um, some hesitancy, right? With this idea, we're so used to that traditional programming like you highlighted, Ben, and it's not that it's negative or bad, it's needed, especially in our under-resourced area, but there is some, um, intimidation a little bit, I feel from this feeling of moving upstream. So I welcome anyone to speak a little bit more about kind of where they're at right now with that thinking. Brittany, it's Michelle. I'd be happy to just say a few words. So as a co-chair of the Community Benefits Advisory Council, I'm pretty aware that our team, you know, did have some reservations about the upstream approach in the larger grants um, because we've had some great success giving smaller grants in two groups. So um, although we did finally, after a lot of discussions, move to that direction and we are up for the challenge, um, you know, some of, some of um, the resistance or the hesitancy was really uh, around some of the work we had formally done and done uh, very well. So um, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Sheila, but I'm just wondering if there's anything you might want to say on behalf of that. I know you're part of the group that helped, you know, make these decisions, but... Um, your thoughts? Thank you, Michelle, and thank you for you know such an articulate explanation of our journey during you know several a few meetings, but certainly that one last meeting about um, making this decision. And you know, to your point, Ben, I think you know the whole issue of systems and policy change, you know, is daunting. Uh, I think in terms of you know the time it takes to accomplish that work and. I, I certainly hear that our more traditional approaches, you know, sometimes feel like putting a Band-Aid on, you know, arterial bleeding. Um, but um, as, as Michelle said, you know, the more we talked about it, the more we, we thought, yes, yes, you know, we certainly understand this and we're on board. And when we look at our region and the barriers that stand between youth and being able to lead a healthy, successful, full life, uh, you know, there are many upstream issues that, you know, come, come to mind. And uh, we have a very committed team who wants to, you know, who has been working together in this space for a long time. Um, but particularly, I think we are looking at the needs of, of youth who, you know, do come from households, you know, lower income households or, you know, households that represent a more diverse population because those inequities in our region impact the, that youth, you know, the most severely. So, um, you know, the, the things we've looked at in the past and the things we will continue to look at are, for instance, transportation, um, the lack of opportunities for education beyond high school that are easily accessible in our region, um, the lack of opportunities for uh, young people who are not just on a smooth career track to college, 
um, you know, who, who might need a different type of career, um, you know, as they move into the workforce and to becoming adults and how to start to address those things when we talked about it more in our group, you know, starting at very early ages, you know, not to wait till someone's senior year in high school to talk about, you know, what their options are and, and be encouraging and um, show that there's a broader world out there. Um, but having to influence those decisions um, and change some things in a way that makes this possible for people. Um, I think, you know, does give us pause when we talk about, you know, how do we help um, empower young people, you know, to, to um, understand some of the resources that are available to them. How do we, um, you know, help to influence government in a way to make, you know, mandate that some of these resources are more available to them and not just to people who've grown up in privilege. So, I'm sure Michelle or, or I see Marlene's on the line. You know, I, I want to point to some of the things that Marlene has done already. Uh, yeah. In terms of addressing yes. that. So <laughs> as a reminder, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with you all are kind of representing the Bay State Wing Hospital service area. So for those who don't know, Sheila Cuddy, Michelle Holmgren, and Dr. Marlene DeLeo are all from that region. So if there's applicants that are watching this or here today that might be interested in applying to that area, these are your people here. Um, so Marlene, yes, we would love for you to share too why a little bit of your perspective with children and youth um, up to young adults and why, you know, your CVAC chose that specific focus area. Well, you know, um, knowing that education um, has tentacles in all areas of life, um, I thought was paramount. And um, when you're setting a plan, uh, what needs to happen? I think, uh, you know, for right now, when you, you are looking at a, uh, a plan, you know, um, we're, we're looking at the effects of COVID and what's happening for kids coming back into schools uh, after, uh, an 18 month hiatus for some students. And we're, we're seeing, you know, uh, the residual effects of this from everywhere from kids K through 12. And um, a number of the different programming that we have put in place prior to uh, COVID, uh, which was a, a CNA course, which was a fire science course, um, we established a manufacturer's partnership council as we are uh, getting ready for the first time. Like we have colleges come in to interview kids. We've got um, manufacturers, um, we're setting up appointments for manufacturers to um, chat with uh, prospective employees um, coming out of uh, school shortly and what that might do for them in being able to secure a job. I think one of the interesting parts of where we find ourselves today, especially knowing that, um, you know, we're having a hard time finding substitute teachers. In fact, we're having a hard time finding teachers. And I think we need to have an understanding of this uh, most recent generation and how they're looking at life um, and what they think is important and what uh, I think is important and what they think is important is two different things. So when we set a plan, we may want to talk to young people because you know what, we're setting parameters that um, when you look at traditional, um, they may still be traditional and not what somebody else thinks is um, meeting their needs. So we as a public school, not a vocational school, are trying to put in programming that has um, offered them, offered students employment out of school. And we're still gonna work towards that end. I mean, at one point, Desi, you know, wanted to make sure everybody, you know, was reading by third grade so everybody can go off and go to college. And um, I was having this discussion this morning with a colleague, 30% of the kids that enter college graduate. So we have 70% of kids who went to college and who are probably getting a, a student loan 
um, don't graduate and go off because life happens and now they have a loan and they're carrying other aspects of what's going on in their life. So um, making sure education and we're educating kids to such and educating families. And I think that's another big aspect that needs to be part of any plan um, because what the changes that you're looking to make are systemic changes and how best can we address and in, 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 um, help change people's understanding uh, when we're trying to move away from systemic in making sure we make systemic change that can um, last across a lifetime and not yeah. just for the moment. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Dilley. I feel like you highlighted the complexity of these issues and there's so many layers. So these are the things that we want our potential applicants to be thinking about and just people in general who are trying to do this work in our community. So thank you all for sharing kind of your perspective from Wing. I see Timothy, your hand is up. Timothy Rennie Blake is helping represent our Franklin CBAC. So I welcome you, Timothy, to share kind of whatever's on your mind too. Good morning, all. Um, I apologize for the video being off. Um, one of the things that I was re, re, um, um, <clears throat> excuse me, resonating with was um, some of the work that I have done um, in the many lifetimes that I've led. And um, I identify as a uh, person uh, with lived experience of um, addiction and a mental health challenge. And I am a grateful person practicing recovery. And one of the things that I know that has been part of my experience working with other people as well as living through my own life is that <clears throat> I um, am sort of missing here um, the understanding of uh, where the um, uh, positions of power have placed the people we are trying to help. And so congratulations to us for recognizing um, <clears throat> racism and the other disparities as uh, foundational in our policy um, changing. And uh, I wish I had the the time to compress the long story and and just you know insert it. But I used to work with um, adolescent teenage uh, uh, adolescent mothers in a GED program, and this was right after the um, uh, welfare reform. So the issue became how do we do that education for these young people. And um, <clears throat> the idea came from the street because there was an altercation between two young ladies and um, it literally started into fisticuffs. And um, so it was at the bus station and some of the staff came out of the building and we were trying to break it all up. And there was a man who came around the corner and he looked at me and he said, your program ain't working brother. You're supposed to be teaching these young, these people how to be young ladies. They're not supposed to be out here trying to fight. And we already knew that, but I went home thinking, how do I deal with this? Because this man was listing to the left and was already halfway through his bottle of Thunderbird for the morning. And I'm thinking, if it's that visible, what do we do? So it wasn't who was being valued, but how are we seeing how we value? I'm not seeing how yet we value the people who need this. And it's again goes right back to racism and, um, you know, the 1619, that's where the valuing system began when these transactions. Um, became um, the norm for monetizing people. So um, where is the burden change um, or burden or change event uh, agent here in Franklin County? One of the things that we are dealing with is a lot of those kinds of people with those kinds of attitudes. And what I'd like to be able to advocate for and put structure on is 
where is the um, interaction that allows a person to take on the identity. When I was mm -hmm. teaching, people would say, what do you teach? And I say, I can't teach anything. The only thing I can do is try to help other people acquire the knowledge they need. Mm -hmm. We need the knowledge from these people and it means yes. changing who we are, how we are. And so um, thanks for listening to that story, but it helps me to f put a frame around uh, why Franklin County is working more mm -hmm. upstream. 100%. Thank you, Timothy. And just a reminder for folks. So I think what you spoke to, Timothy, aligns so much with, you know, seeking proposals that engage people with lived experience, but thinking about how we do that, how are we looking at um, who's at the table and how do we integrate that into policy making into different sectors. So Franklin's um, focus is a little broad that you can look at that through a education lens, through a, is it housing? Um, but Cheryl Pascuccio would love for you to share kind of for one more minute or so, because we have two other groups that we need to get to, but from your perspective too, working at Bay State Hospital, but also serving on the CBAC, why this was such a critical need. Sure, I can speak quickly to that. Uh, we've had quite a few program grants in Franklin County and learned quickly that uh, the people that really needed to be at the table when we decided how to do those program grants were missing. And that's a horrible thing to learn when you're very deep into the work. And we don't want to make that mistake again. We want to make sure that, that if we have a program or we have an initiative or we're working on, on any number of things that people with lived experience are at the table and helping us in and making sure we're going in the right direction. So. Thank you so great. much, Cheryl. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm sure folks will have the opportunity to ask you more questions if needed. Um, Beth Cardillo is here with us from Armbrook Village, representing the Bay State Noble Hospital CBAC. Um, and Noble's uh, RFP kind of lens this year is seeking proposals that advance issues of equity and anti-racism within different institutions and in their broader community. So Beth, if you can share a little bit of where you know, how the CBAC started talking about this focus area too, and kind of what some areas of interest are from the group. Oh, Brittany, I'm really, um, I'm not prepared to speak because I actually wasn't at that meeting. So I, um, you can I speak would... broadly just from, you know, the broader experience of where our conversations have gone in the basic noble area from, you know, the community health needs assessment work we do and the Better Together grants and how all that learning has kind of brought us to this place. Well, I think for kind of being on that, um, the community health needs assessment, and if you're looking at the bigger picture, you know, um, Ben, when I'm, do we call you Ben or Benjamin? It's Ben okay? My, my son it's is Ben. preferred. I'm not sure why it says Benjamin right there. I'm oh, all right. My, my stepson's a Ben. So um, looking at this and, and the upstream and downstream, I'm going to say in my head, I'm feeling like um, it's the difference between um, proaction and reaction in some ways, right? And I think our very healthy discussions with the Shana have really made us look at um, on a bigger picture in general of kind of um, white supremacy issues and where we are going with that. And it's been some really, really difficult discussions. Um, and what, um, God, what happened at the last meeting was that it was all white people that were talking in the discussion and everybody of color was like sitting out. And so what hit me about that was we were displaying it right there right? That people weren't feeling comfortable, um, people of color, whatever, being a part of the discussion. We have so much work to do. That's all I can say is that we have so much work to do. Westfield, um, the area that we represent is, I would say, pretty conservative and pretty white. Um, so I, I don't even know where to start. I don't know <laughs> what else to say, Brittany. No, that's great. It's, it's filled with with, with so much and not looking at um, 
kind of the health issues, but how do we dig deeper, you know, upstream and, and look at the systemic issues? And I think that's what we're all grappling with right now. Thank you, Beth. And I think um, you said it best, right? I think the CBAC as a whole and that conversation was we do want to start talking about these issues of racial equity and in an intentional way for our community. So this is the beginning of that learning process. So um, they're hoping, the hope is that proposals would try to create some type of infrastructure advocacy around how can you know, greater Westfield and the Hill towns begin to discuss issues of equity and anti-racism with different institutions. Is it the schools? Is it municipalities? Is it government? So um, we're excited to see kind of what, what can start. So that was a great response, Beth, thank you. And, and I also think that when you said, Ben, before, are we up for the challenge? When we get these proposals, I think we'll know it when we see it right? It's hard to figure out what that's going to look like now, but we'll be able to identify it. And Brittany, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, when we get these proposals, there is time to talk to some of these folks that are submitting them, how to, if we're not seeing the meat that we need for it, to be able to give them some, some assistance. Yeah, so as a reminder, this is kind of a two-part um, process. So based on what we see in round one, we'll do some initial scoring and there will be some um, screening out of proposals, but there is a finalist round where we can, you know, if we see potential in a proposal, but need to learn more, um, this, the review team can vote to move that team to the next round and, and do that. So correct. That will be and if, if I could just add the other, um, I'm sure. Courtney Bournes, I'm a consultant that works with the Bay State Health team. Um, one of the things we've added as well this year, to your point, Beth, is something we're calling feedback panels. And um, those are optional, but it's a chance to get some feedback kind of midstream while you're developing your proposal. So that's really the place where we can do very active feedback for people about like, here's what would take this proposal further upstream in terms of the intervention. Um, once the proposal is submitted, there is that second round, but I think as much as we can get people earlier in the proposal development to engage with us, that I think we can give the more constructive feedback earlier. Wonderful. Thanks, Courtney, for adding that. And we'll kind of summarize at the end to some other opportunities um, for engagement in the coming weeks. Uh, so last, we have Kelly Lamas helping to represent the Bay State Medical Center CBAC, who are seeking proposals, again, on education related to workforce development. Um, you know, Wayne Hospital is looking at that from a specifically children, youth, and young adult lens. Um, BMC is a little broader, but Kelly, if you could kind of share from your experience and also just out of broader conversations with your community engagement, why the CBAC and you feel like this is an important issue to address with RFP. Thanks, Brittany. Um, I will try uh, to answer that question from my memory of all our CBAC meetings. But I know the first round of proposals, I was part of the reviewers, and I know that there was a lot of questions that had come up on what it really, what we're really looking for. And then in further conversations that we had as a CBAC, we were really looking at workforce development as a whole. We got back to some issues around, we're thinking about young people and violence and poverty, right? And so what really is at the crux of that? And we were thinking about workforce development and how do we frame that? Um, for our request for proposals. And so um, thinking about ROCA, right? So that uh, other CBO that's out there. And so thinking about also transitional youth, right? So broadening broadening um, the populations that we're looking for. I used to work with the BSET program, right? And workforce development and career readiness um, with young people. So there's a, definitely a need in our BMC region for more workforce development. And opportunities for that you know one question that always comes up again is you know the systemic barriers to this right and so when we're looking at education from a workforce development lens um what's the question that i have in my head and thinking about ben's presentation is that you know i'm curious to see um the proposals that we receive and upstream versus downstream because we're really talking about upstream then you know there's a lot of, there's other um powers um and of the system at play for that and what does that mean and who's going to be at the table if you know if there are some upstream proposals that we receive thank you so much and i think another thing to highlight is we all know greater springfield is the most resourced in terms of you know actual cbo's we tend to get the most funding compared to our other communities that we serve um but that doesn't mean that there isn't 
more opportunity to maybe um, be more collaborative and kind of look at um, broader advocacy among many different organizations that are doing, you know, career readiness or workforce development. But how do we bring those people to the table and um, move a little bit more upstream and have almost like a collective action approach to these issues? So I think for Basic Medical Center, that'll be an interesting um, challenge uh, for this region, especially since partnership is a requirement this year. You know, how do you do this work in partnership with someone else and then look look at it from a, a little bit more upstream lens. Um, so those were our kind of, yes, Ben, go for it. I just, um, two, two quick reflections from what I've, I've been hearing, um, just to share what's on my mind. Um, the first is that I think it was um, Sheila made, made a, um, a comment about sort of the size of grants. And um, I think that this is a common, um, Thing when people are talking about doing upstream related work that there's this idea that it has to cost more that you have to be like tackling something really big and that's going to cost a lot more resources and so what's the value in doing upstream work if the size of the grant is not really is not is not huge is not up, up to um, meet the meet the sort of idea that you have in in your head about what really needs to change the only thing I'd say about that is I, I think that um, it, it, the opposite is actually quite true like I, um, in almost every case I can think of, individual level intervention is much more expensive than, um, than policy level solutions are to problems. Um, almost any public health issue I can think of that, that is the case and I can, I can rattle off um, lots of different examples. The other, the other thing I, I'm sort of hearing is, is and this is also super um, common, is like if we're not, if we're, if we're doing upstream work and we're not like tackling sort of the real root the real root issue, like what, and we're not doing that in some incredibly expansive, big way, like if we're not dismantling structural racism, um, sort of in a sort of big global sense, what's the point of doing anything that's um, sort of moving ourselves upstream in that, in that, um, in that, um, along that path. And um, I think it's really heartening that some of these grant programs are being structured so that there's an opportunity for people to actually try to tackle those issues pretty head on, but you can tackle those issues head on in really small ways, right? Um, so maybe there's maybe there's a, an approach to um, supporting um, um, uh, anti-racism um, workshops and conversations in one housing complex, in one neighborhood, in one community. That is as viable a strategy as any other strategy I can possibly think of. Um, and then the other, the other um, challenge I think that's out there is just to, no matter sort of what the target of change is across these four um, hospitals that the, the, um, the idea that, and I think this was, um, Timothy was really trying to, um, uh, this is, at least this is what I heard Timothy saying, um, is that, um, you know, the people who are closest to the pain are closest to the power to use Ayanna Presley's um, uh, words. Um, and I think that approach, um, if sort of baked into what it is that people are putting forward, is going to um, is going to create um, the opportunity to really tackle some of those more root cause issues. So, anyway, those are the reflections I have here in the conversation. Your parting words. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you. Um, and I see some agreement coming in with the chat. Um, so we just want to give a few reminders. So for folks who are potentially looking to apply for this Better Together grant opportunity, I did post in the chat again, kind of our landing page, which is basedayhealth.org slash um, apply for funding, if to read up on all these focus areas. And as the workshops are developing, we will be posting the recordings of all these workshops for so folks can watch them. Um, in case they want to go back to anything that they heard. And a few other reminders. So tomorrow, November 3rd, is the last day to request a mini grant uh, up to $5,000 for proposal development. So if your organization is um, thinking about applying, it doesn't need to be a fully fleshed out idea. Um, it can be like the beginnings of something. You can request up to $5,000 to help support that proposal development. And to request that, all you have to do is email governmentcommunity at baystatehealth.org. Again, that's on our website. Uh, we have a, more workshops coming up this week and next. So we remind folks to please sign up for any others that may be of interest to you and invite your other um, networks to, to participate in those too. They're open for the broader community, not just for 
potential applicants to the request proposals. And as Courtney mentioned as well, we do have signups open and, re and up for feedback panels, which will be the 20 minute sessions where folks can come in and just talk to us about your idea and um, come in with any specific questions that you may have to see, hey, is this, is this fitting with what you think um, the grant reviewers will be looking for? Did I miss any other kind of important announcements or key dates, Courtney or Anna Marie? Yeah, awesome. Well, on behalf of Bay State, we thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and we are here if you have any questions and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you all.